children of Israel are going to have to experience some time in exile that that they are going to be uprooted from the promised land and they are going to have to live in Babylonian captivity and God says Jeremiah here's what you need to tell the children of Israel the reason that I'm doing this the reason that I'm allowing them to go through a difficult time is because they have been unfaithful to me God calls them an adulterer God says, the reason that is happening is because I'm a jealous God. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, and I'll have no other gods before me. And God is saying, and you have put other stuff in front of me, and I'm supposed to be the number one priority in your life. And whatever takes precedence over me, God says, you are unfaithful. Oh, oh God, this is even even why God commands the prophet Hosea to marry a prostitute. See, see, T Pain was not the only individual and the first one to fall in love with a stripper. You, you, you gotta read, you gotta read the, the book of Hosea, and, and God tells the prophet Hosea, God says, Hosea, you, you need to marry Gagomer, that, that prostitute. You need to fall in love with her and you need to marry her. And Hosea, he's complaining, he's like, God, what is what's the well, I can't understand this? I love her, I take care of her, I, I, I provide for her, I've given her all of my love. But that doesn't stop her. She keeps tipping out. She keeps cheating. God, what am I supposed to do? God says, well, now you know how I feel. God said, I, I'm married to the children of Israel. I'm married to believers. But when they put their job, when they put their dreams, when they put their aspirations, when they put money above me, they keep tipping out. So you got to understand. Touch a neighbor and tell them, we got to unpack this. We have to understand the anatomy of an affair. Oh, how does it happen? How, how, how do individuals get to a place when they're in an affair, whether it's physical or whether it's spiritual? You don't just fall into it. And the best example, the best dissection of an affair that reveals its anatomy is Second Samuel chapter number 11. And many of us, if you spend any time around church you've heard the story David and Bathsheba had an illicit relationship Bathsheba was married David was married and so what they did was not right in the eyes of God but but before you jump to your logical conclusion slow down a bit because God has literally opened the pages of his holy word and dissected this relationship right in front of us so we can understand the anatomy of an affair how do how do affairs start they all start the same way they all start the same way They all start, number one, when complacency sets in. They all start the same way. Affairs, they all start when complacency sets in. When you you open up chapter 11 and read verse 1, the first thing that's evident is that the setting of David's life has dramatically changed. What what this means is that his demeanor, his disposition, it's changed. It's, It's changed. And the fact that it's changed is what's opened the door for this affair. Verse 1 says that when the time of the year came around again, somebody say again, the anniversary of the Ammonite aggression, David dispatched Joab and his fighting men in full force to destroy them for good. They laid seats to Rabbi, but David stayed in Jerusalem. And one late afternoon, David got up from taking a nap and was just strolling around on the roof of the palace. Now, now this is the same battle that David had a year ago. One year ago, David was fighting the Ammonites and God gave him victory, but David did not destroy all of them. Some of them ran, and so now a year later, they come back, and, and it's time to go to war again. And so uh, the, uh, the, the last year, last year, one year ago, David is in the battle, and he leads the battle. He's out on the battlefield, leads uh, his, his troops into battle, and they're victorious. Now, one year later... One year later, the battle is the same. The enemy is the same. But David has changed. David's demeanor is totally different. Now, now, David wants to chill. He wants to take a nap while everybody else is willing to go fight. And the first door that opens to an affair is when your demeanor and when your disposition changes and you just check out. You check out mentally, you check out physically, you check out emotionally, but everybody else is still willing to fight. 
See, the point is, the point is that David is no longer doing what he used to do. And it was what he used to do that gave him the victory in the first place. David, David used to be the one that would fight easily lions and tigers and bears. David was the one that had no problem running up on Goliath and saying, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that dare try to defy the armies of the very living God? David had no problem in the very beginning going to battle and leading his troops in war. But now that he's comfortable, now that he's gotten the palace, now that Saul is no longer an issue, now that he's no longer just leading Judah, but he's leading Judah and Israel, now his whole demeanor's changed. His whole demeanor's changed. He's comfortable, he's complacent, and he doesn't even know it, but he's just opened the door for an affair. See, this is why sometimes the greatest way that the enemy will attack us is just by sitting back and waiting until we get comfortable. Because the enemy knows that when we get comfortable, we're going to let our guard down. The enemy knows that when we get comfortable, we're, we're, we're not going to do what we used to do in the very beginning. And sometimes the enemy says, I'm, I'm not going to mess with them now because it's new. They, they, they are kind of in the beginning stages. He says, but let me just wait. Let me, let me wait when the newness wears off. Let me wait when they let their guard down and get comfortable. That's when I will attack. I, I never forget when I was... When I was starting a date and I had, I, you know, I had the cool water cologne, I had, I had the 63 Volkswagen uh, Super Beetle with the rims and the booming system. And I remember I was going out on this date and I'll never forget it. I was fresh, fresh to death. I'm telling you, like a million bucks. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> fresh to death. You know, flew on. No. But, but, but anyway, I, I'm, I'm fly. I was thinking through all my ballet shoes and my fly green socks. But, but. But, but I was fresh to death. I was, I was just fly. And I remember, you know, I was going on this date and I had the flowers and I had the chocolates and, and I was, you know, the, 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 the rims were nice. The, the car was washed up. It was clean. You know, I, ha I had those kind of uh, fabulous air fresheners that make your nostrils hurt, but they really take out all of the odor in the car. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, y'all trying to act like y'all never had? Okay. And I'm walking out the door. My mother says, whoa, slow. What are you doing? I said, see, I got this date. She said, yeah, but I see you got flowers and candy and you spent all the time waxing the car and all of that stuff. You got your, got your mixtape ready. She said, but, but here, let me share something with you. She said, if you start the relationship with clean cars and flowers and candy and mixtapes and cool water cologne, she says, then you're going to have to continue flowers and candy and mixtape." The worst thing you can do in a relationship is start the relationship one way, get in a relationship, get comfortable, let your demeanor change, and then let your guard down. One of the biggest reasons that couples drift apart and unknowingly they throw open the door to an affair is because in the beginning you worked hard. You, the car was nice, the appearance was nice, the hair was nice, you worked, you worked hard. But once you got in the relationship, you got comfortable. And what you got to remember is that it was the hard work that you put in that generated the feelings that got you to the altar and made you willing to make the vow that you're going to love to death do you part. And the vow was not a vow to get in a relationship and get comfortable and get complacent. The vow was a vow to keep doing what you were doing in the very beginning and even the more so. This is why 1 John chapter 3 verse 16, it teaches us, that love is an action, which literally means that when the actions change, no surprise then that the love will change. You got to understand, family, that a good relationship, whether it's a married relationship, whether it's a spiritual relationship with God, a great relationship will demand everything, not a little, not, not what you feel like giving. It will demand everything. And, and in the body of Christ particularly, we love to use these cliche phrases and we say, you know, these phrases that are, that are really old and overused, stuff like, I'm going to go to the next level. And oftentimes we say this and we really don't even understand what that means. Because if you really want to go to the next level, then that means you got to work twice as hard as you did in the beginning to get you to this place. This is why the worst thing you can do when you say, I want to take my marriage to the next level, I want to take my finances to the next level, is to stop working. Because life doesn't operate on a level playing field. Either you are moving forward, and if you're doing nothing, you are moving 
backwards. And this is the same reason that so many people cheat on God as it relates to their spiritual relationship. Because in the beginning, boy, we were